The university has committed a tremendous amount of resources to help the economics department grow. We want to try to provide the highest possible quality instruction in modern economic thought, do the highest possible quality research, but also support the mission of the university. Joe Kaboski, for example, uh, has spent a lot of his academic career worrying about programs in developing countries that are designed to uh, help those less fortunate move out of the situation that they're in. The questions that are driving my research are uh, questions of economic development. When you consider why are people poor in the world, it's usually because of the country that they were born in. And so in that sense, global poverty is a macroeconomic question. And so my approach to research is thinking about micro-development questions about uh, people, but thinking about them in the macro sense. Some of my uh, research is evaluating microfinance projects, and this was a, a joint project with Catholic Relief Services and, um, and us and the Gates Foundation. There are programs called savings groups or self-help groups that have become a big development policy. In Sub-Saharan Africa, a lot of NGOs wanted to reach more people than they otherwise could. So they had the idea, instead what we'll do is we'll train people to start these groups and send them out on their own to become entrepreneurs and they can just charge the clients uh, for services the way any other bank would, rather than offering them for free. Now they wanted to evaluate this program. The way we answered this was by running an experiment where some people got the program uh, that was free and some people got the program that they had to pay for. What we found was surprising, which was the charging of fees was actually the beneficial thing. When you charge the fees, you get the people that are very serious about the program to be involved. As a development economist, usually we're finding the programs that we thought worked don't work. And this was the case where we found a program that we didn't think would work actually did work. Casey Buckles does a lot of work on the economics of the family, which focuses on what are the incentives for people to get married? What are the incentives for families to bring in foster children into their household? What are the incentives for families to have another child? So one of the things that I'm really interested in right now is how the sibling environment that one grows up in affects their later life outcomes. So for example, how does the number of siblings that you have or the spacing between your, you and your siblings affect your wages, your education level, your health later on in life? And I think this is really interesting because family Family size in the United States is getting uh, smaller, so we'd like to know the consequence of that change. And then also as people are moving to the two and three child norm, the spacing between the siblings becomes one of the really important choices that people still have to make. So one recent project of mine that I worked on with a graduate student, Elizabeth Munich, uh, looks at the effect of birth spacing between siblings on their longer term outcomes. We know that greater spacing is good for maternal and infant health, but nobody had really looked at the longer term consequences of the spacing between siblings on things like uh, cognitive development or education educational attainment. And so we find that when the spacing is greater because of outcomes for the older child in terms of cognitive development are better. It has no effect on the outcomes for the younger child, interestingly. I'm really interested in thinking about siblings going forward. Most people I think would agree that their siblings uh, and their sibling environment that they grew up in has been really formative uh, for them in some way. I don't think we really understand how all of those different components um, work together to produce human capital, how those things affect long-term educational attainment, wages, and health. On the macro side, economists such as Eric Sims are uh, asking important questions about the business cycle. Well, I'm in interested in the kind of questions that the layperson typically reads about in the newspaper. What is the Federal Reserve doing? Uh, what are the effects of fiscal stimulus, et cetera, et cetera. On the one hand, I have focused on sources of business cycle fluctuations. Why does the economy fluctuate up and down? Why does the unemployment rate rise and fall? Um, and then the second area of my research is about economic policy. How ought fiscal and monetary policy at an aggregate macro level respond to the business cycle in a way that maximizes the well-being of the people in an economy and minimizes the volatility of macroeconomic aggregates. I'm currently working in collaboration with a former graduate student, Jonathan Wolf, who's now an assistant professor at Miami University in Ohio, as well as a current graduate student, Carlos Moreno, um, is what we loosely call optimal fiscal consolidation. One of the things that we're working on in this ongoing project is how ought governments to optimally reduce their debt. 
And so we look at the question, suppose that a government comes around and decides that it wants to reduce its holdings of debt. How ought it to optimally do that? And then once you have the answer to that question, when ought governments to reduce their debt? Should they do it when economies are in depressed situations like we've been in the wake of the Great Recession? Should they do it when economies are booming? By how much should they try to reduce debt? Et cetera, et cetera. And so this is a really pertinent question for a lot of governments. Our research is looking into how can governments avoid getting themselves in these situations. And then in my own particular case, my colleague Jim Sullivan and I have started the Wilson Sheehan Lab for Economic Opportunities. Uh, or LEO. LEO is a research center that's trying to find evidence-based solutions to poverty. Uh, and what makes LEO unique is that we've partnered with Catholic Charities, uh, which is the largest network of social service providers in the country, uh, to go on the ground uh, and evaluate their programs and see which ones are delivering as promised, which ones are actually moving people out of poverty. The next big breakthrough is going to be for people that get access to new and different data sets. So one nice aspect of uh, our work with LEO is that we're partnering with a lot of local social service agencies uh, that have a tremendous amount of information. This data has not been tapped by any academic researcher to date, and so I think that gives us an advantage in terms of answering some of these more difficult questions. Here at Notre Dame, teaching and research are both at the center of what, the, what we do and what we try to, and what we want to excel at. Our teaching informs our research, our research informs our teaching, our students inspire us to ask better questions, our research inspires us to present material to students in better ways. We have a really great faculty to graduate student ratio. Our graduate students get a lot of attention from faculty and that really means that we have a lot of value added. Our students have done very well in the job market. If you take a look at our placement records, uh, the outcomes have been actually pretty impressive. Part of the reason why they've done well is because they've been very prepared uh, in the research process. So Notre Dame is really doing something interesting in that they have the goal of both being a top research institution, but they also have this unique uh, Catholic identity. So regardless of your faith background or your personal beliefs, the Catholic mission of Notre Dame really means that it's a place where people are interested in work that matters. The scholars in our department are at the forefront of academic research. Their work is appearing in uh, the best journals in the profession. Our work is also being supported by uh, prestigious uh, grant-making organizations. What's exciting about Notre Dame is we have so many resources to hire additional people, and with the Keough School, even more people coming on board. So we're going to move to the brand new uh, Nanavik Hall. Our graduate students, our faculty, our staff, the Lab for Economic Opportunities, we're all going to be in one place. We're going to have the space that we need uh, to grow as a department, and we're going to have the facilities that are going to really make this uh, a world-class institution.